Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Andrew Ferguson is the senior editor for the Weekly Standard Magazine and the author of a number of books, including Crazy You, One Dad's Crash Course in Getting His Kids Into College. Andy uh, covered George H.W. Bush as a journalist during the 1980s and then worked in the White House for President Bush as a speechwriter in the early 1990s. A former U.S. ambassador to Qatar. Qatar? Qatar? What's I say Qatar. Qatar. <laughs> Chase Untermeyer worked in the 1966 campaign in which George H.W. Bush was elected to Congress from Houston and remained with Mr. Bush for half a century. Chase's Houston office was just across the hall from Mr. Bush's office until Mr. Bush's death. Chase is the author of several books, including When Things Went Right, The Dawn of the Reagan-Bush Administration, which is based on his meticulous journals as the then vice president's assistant. By the way, I should note that I myself worked as a speechwriter when Mr. Bush was uh, vice president. Chase and Andy, welcome. Thank you. Okay. Your very first thought when you learned that at the age of 94, last week, he had died. Chase? Of course, it was a, a thing long in coming. But even so, when a force as large as that and as strong as that is removed, uh, there's nothing that can just quite describe it. In many ways, for me, uh, George Bush was like a second father. So it was like a member of the family dying. Mm -hmm. Andy? Well, I had no personal relationship with him in the way that Chase We have did, to stipulate. Certainly. Chase was with him for half a century. Yeah, so yeah. Nobody and, else. And you're not Longer that old. than I've been alive, in fact, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, my first thought was actually a, a positive one, which was, what a fantastic life. Mm. You know, it, it, with the biblical phrase, full of years and um, wonderful achievements, thousands and thousands of friends and lives that he touched. I just thought, if you're going to do it, this is the way to do it. That was the way to do it. Other end of it. How did you first meet him? When? How? You know, do I, you don't, know? I, I met him when he was vice president at a social event. I think, and um, and then I was asked to write speeches for him. Uh, actually, it was very interesting. After three years of writing very critical things <laughs> about the Bush administration, I got this call from uh, then the chief speechwriter Tony Snow, asking me to be to be the would be a speechwriter. And I said, "Well, have you read any of my stuff over the last three years?" He said, "Oh, he won't care. He won't care." He didn't. Actually. So actually, let's take that for just a moment because it happens that at the start of the current administration, a couple of people who work in high positions in the Trump administration called me. You probably got calls like this saying, can you find me some young kid to be a speechwriter? And I in turn made a couple of phone calls and recommended a couple of young kids. And it turned out that those kids couldn't make it through the White House personnel office because Two years ago, they tweeted something critical of Donald Trump. Mm. And I thought to myself, your case, where you were perfectly critical of George Bush, when he, and as president, he said, oh, it doesn't matter. Come on and write for me. Maureen Dowd wrote a piece in the New York Times the other day. No one was more critical of George Bush in, in the New York Times of all places. And it turns out that the two of them were writing notes to each other. He was particularly for a politician, but for a human being full stop. He was just a wonderfully forgiving man. Is that so? Oh, absolutely. I think uh, of others outside the journalism profession. For example, uh, George Mitchell, the Democratic oh, leader yes. of the U.S. Senate, majority leader, did George Bush absolutely no favors. After all, it is the duty of the opposition to oppose. And he certainly rubbed George Bush's nose legislatively several times. And yet, every time President Bush went to Maine, he would give a call to the majority leader and offer a ride on the airplane. Oh, the sort of thing that would make us more hard-bitten, nasty-minded <laughs> politicos uh, cringe that he would do that. Nobody uh, hurt George Bush more than Senator Sam Nunn, who engineered the defeat of uh, John Tower as uh, Secretary of Defense, a very early defeat. And yet, uh, President Bush was only too happy to hire Sam Nunn's daughter to head the Points of Light Foundation. And then, of course, we know about the amazing friendship that developed between him and the man who beat him for president, Bill Clinton. So those are more examples of exactly, of exactly that kind that of point. heart that you're referring to. So, Chase, when did, what on earth were you doing? You grew up 
in New Jersey, as I recall? Where, where were you grown? Where were you born? I was born in New Jersey, but my family moved to Texas in 1948, which was the same year the Bushes moved there. All right, so you grew up in Texas. Yes. Harvard undergrad, he went to Yale. So what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make is there's a New England or Northeastern background for you, as indeed there was for him. How did you end up working for him in 1966? I was you were, when a, you were still an undergrad, weren't you at that? Yes, an undergraduate who, since my mid-teenage years, had worked in one hopeless Republican campaign after another in the Texas of that era, which was totally dominated by the Democratic Party, top to bottom. I uh, worked for John Tower in his successful Senate race in 1961, but every one after that I ever handed out a brochure or rang a doorbell was defeated. Along came a new congressional district on the west side of Houston, which is the Republican part of the area, and George Bush, having been an unsuccessful candidate for the U.S. Senate two years before, was the natural uh, fellow to be nominated. And when he did, uh, he certainly captured my imagination and attention, not just because he was a fellow Yankee who had moved into Texas, right. but because he represented the freshness, the energy, the um, positive nature of a Republican Party, which frankly was missing in the uh, rather crabby, uh, small Republican Party of Texas at the time. All right, so let, let's stay with that for just a moment if we, if we could. He moved to Texas in 1948. This is, there, we've already talked about how gracious he was, how kind he was, and there was a lot of that in the eulogies today. Let's stipulate, uh, granted, and we'll come back to it because that was so much of who he was, but He's a, uh, he enlists in the Navy at the, what I'm trying to point out is that early in, the early in his life, before he's a national figure, he does things that show real toughness. He enlists at the age of 18. By the time he's 20, he's flown 58 combat missions and been shot down once. And then when he goes home, he goes through Yale, captain of the baseball team, and instead of doing what Andy or I would have done if we'd been lucky enough to be born in those privileged circumstances, mm -hmm. which is follow, the old ma follow his father to Wall Street <laughs> yes. and buy a house of, in Darien or Greenwich himself, <laughs> he moves to Texas yes. and becomes a, a wildcatter of <laughs> looking for, okay. And for the rest of his life, the criticism is, oh, he was never a real Texan. <laughs> Address that one. What well, did Texas yeah. mean to him? Well, first of all, anybody can become a Texan. This is unlike a Virginian, where you have to have 10 generations behind you before you can claim to be a Virginian. Right. Uh, so anyone who rolls across the border, as they did in a Studebaker in 1948, can become a Texan. All you have to do is embrace your inner Texanity, uh, which is uh, a, a spirit more than it is merely knowing about the Alamo and Sam Houston and Davy Crockett. Is there a reason why it sounds like insanity? <laughs> <laughs> Texanity is a, a good enough word, or Texanism. But uh, what, what, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the idea of anybody coming into the frontier, and Texas is even more of a frontier, needless to say, in 1948 than now, but uh, wanting to make their own way. Uh, okay, they have a background, everybody uh, might be interested in that, but people in Texas have always been focused on the present and the future, and that very much was George Bush's operative mental attitude as opposed to people around Washington, D.C., who are focused on the present and the past. Right. And that tends to be a very heavy weight that holds people back, whereas uh, in the wide open skies of West Texas, uh, they only inspired him. And one more, I'm coming back to you, so don't, <laughs> so remain yeah, alert. <laughs> <laughs> but one more question on Texas. You've told me, when we were talking about this in his early days, that when he and you were trying to build a Republican party in Texas, you're trying to turn Texas into a two-party state. Yes. And what you and he heard over and over and over again was, we don't need two parties. We already have two parties, liberal Democrats and conservative Democrats. Just go ahead and join the Democratic Party. He could, why didn't he do that? Life, life would have been easier for him. I mean, really, was there that much policy difference between him and Lloyd Benson? No, not much at all. So, what, so what, that was another one of these things that he did that just shows either courageous determination or just plain pig-headedness. It was a desire to create in that rather desolate territory of West Texas something familiar. Something familiar in politics meant having two parties. That's what was the case in Connecticut. 
uh, to say the least, in that particular time. And the idea that one party should uh, look over the shoulder of the other party to keep them honest. In Texas, the conservative branch of the Democratic Party had been predominant essentially since the Civil War. There were liberals of a sort who barked uh, and nipped at the heels of the conservatives, and occasionally they won election. Ralph Yarborough, who beat, Ralph, him, beat Mr. Bush the first time he ran for the Senate, uh, right? Excellent, the excellent example. Uh, but that still was not the same in George Bush's mind or that of any of the other early pioneers of the Republican Party who felt that for one thing, the National Democratic Party was not the legitimate home of Texans who were conservative by inheritance and that it should be the Republican Party. However, there was still the dead weight, believe it or not, of the Reconstruction era where when I was a teenager passing out those brochures, I would hear people say, well, I, I like the way your candidate thinks, but my granddaddy would roll over in his grave if he knew that I voted for a Republican. And frankly, it just took those people as well as granddaddy to be in the cemetery before things finally shifted to the Republican Party. Got it. Got it. Andy, what was it like to write speeches for George Bush? Uh, well, I've never written a speech before. <laughs> so, uh, so it was terrifying from, right from the beginning. Um, my sense, Chase would, would know this better because he was in closer, but my sense of it as a journalist writing about him on the outside was in the changeover from uh, Reagan to Bush, there were definite, almost symbolic, but stylistic changes that the, the, the Bush people wanted to impress on the public. And one of them was, this is a guy who's, uh, he gets his hands dirty, he's the one who's, he's a policy guy, he's a pragmatist, he likes uh, the machinery of government, and we're going to have less showbiz and less sort of pomp and circumstance. Uh, and I think that that reflected a feeling that, that Bush himself had, which was um, it wasn't about speech making, it was about getting things done. And so there was a conscious effort to sort of downgrade the speech writing operation. So you may have heard about this. Exactly. So what you may have heard about these Reagan speechwriters, you know, were a bunch of lunatics, I guess. And, uh, True enough. Um, <laughs> but uh, they, they didn't want the speechwriting shop to be a locus of policy making and that kind of thing. So um, you had a sense writing speeches for him that you weren't really doing the number one thing on the agenda in the, the administration. And it, you know, he could give a good speech, and, right. but. Um, but it wasn't, it, so you, you, it made you feel a little bit um, like you were second tier as working in the, in the White House. Chase, does that sound right to you? I can believe it, although at the start so we of should the point out, you were in the White House with him when he was vice president. When he became president, you went, you had a number of positions, but you went, uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, as I recall, pretty quickly. Isn't that right? I was in that position in the Reagan administration. Uh, so that at the start of the uh, first Bush administration, I was the personnel director. Sorry. Yeah, which okay. is one of the reasons and you why. you let him slip through? <laughs> well, no, I, I, he was going by. I always said that my job either started or stopped at the White House steps, depending on which way you were facing. So <laughs> facing inside the White House, I had no responsibility over the recruitment of outstanding speechwriters. Uh, the other way around, it was my responsibility to advise on cabinet, subcabinet positions, ambassadorships, and the rest, which was so all-consuming that everything of, uh, you might say, public consequence that the president did, such as give speeches, was really beyond my uh, immediate uh, concern because I had to figure out who was going to be an assistant secretary of commerce. All right, and yet... <clears throat> I will not let you sidestep the <laughs> George Bush and words question yes. too terribly easily because when I got hired in the summer of 1982 as a speechwriter, nor had and he was vice president then, nor had I ever written a speech, <laughs> and Chase Untermeyer saved my bacon because for the that's all that summer you don't remember this well uh, please continue all right <laughs> so I would write a draft and then I would run over from the old executive office building to Chase's office hoping nobody important, well, you were important, but hoping nobody truly important would see me because Chase had a little office right off the vice president's office and Chase would sit down with me and very calmly say, well, no, this, and he, would, he was my editor mm. and could, all right. So you, so you actually knew what would work for him and what would not. And furthermore, 
Now, I, this sounds as though I'm, I'm playing a gotcha here, <laughs> but it's, I'm taking this from a public document. Your book, <laughs> which is based on your journals, and you note that when I was hired, you took me aside and said, your job, young man, <laughs> is to make him seem more conservative than he is. <laughs> oh. Now yes, explain that one, Chase. Well, first of all, to talk about language, uh, George Bush hated to talk about himself, which mm -hmm. is, after all, the principal the job of topic the of interest in a politician. Right. Uh, however, he was the son of Dorothy Walker Bush, who absolutely excoriated him whenever he talked about himself too much. And as a result, the use of I, which is probably the most popular word uh, uttered by politicians, was uh, to be scrubbed out at every opportunity to talk about himself in any way. In fact, uh, Peggy Noonan uh, thought that when he took the oath of office, he would say something like, solemnly swear, <laughs> uh, as opposed to uh, at the uh, first person there. So that was his particular approach to right. language. He didn't mind what the words were. He might have trouble pronouncing them um, or, or getting out uh, an extemporaneous sentence or two. Uh, but the subject matter was always, especially in the vice presidential years, to be on Ronald Reagan and his yes. policies Got rather it. than what George Bush was doing. Now, uh, to explain uh, after all these many years my advice to you, was the fact that, of course, George Bush was the exemplar of the moderate or centrist wing of the Republican Party as it then existed. Which in was why Ronald Reagan had invited him to join the ticket to unify the party. All right. Exactly, and by all reports was hesitant to make him his running mate because he wasn't quite so sure that George Bush embraced the conservatism as uttered by Ronald Reagan for so many years, and that was largely true. Now, of course, an oil man in Texas active in the Republican Party had a certain degree or base level of conservatism. Right. It's just that from a stylistic point of view, George Bush always hated to talk about that in the way the typical Texas politician would. For example, using the word conservative in every possible sentence and every possible permutation. So that, I suspect, was the advice to you, okay. that he, wanted, he needed to talk the language of the administration. That was the, 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 the if I can remember back all those years, the message was no distance between him and the president. He wants to demonstrate total loyalty. Okay. Now, excuse me, I return to you, and again, once again, in this slightly accusatory mode, <laughs> but a gentle, gentle accusatory mode. Kinder and gentle <laughs> yes, exactly. mode. President Bush's vice president, Dan Quayle, in the Wall Street Journal just the day after the president died, quote, quote, in the Wall Street Journal where everybody could see it, he could have paid more attention to his own speeches and would doubtless have fared better if he had written more of them himself. His letters reveal a lovely and insightful writer." Close quote. That's, that's true, isn't that's it? Don't we all true. feel that way? That's yes. absolutely true. So wh why, did he, why did he hire the likes of us? <laughs> his, well, he sound, in his letters he sounded relaxed. He, he sounded like himself. Very he had funny. a voice. Yeah, very funny. But it's not really a presidential voice, see? And, and I think he understood that. Those wonderful letters are, I mean, it's a classic of um, what, the, what the lit crit people call it, the <laughs> American plain style. It's just, it's totally unaffected, direct, as, as you say. And, um, but that's not good for all occasions. Um, and again, as I say, he wasn't necessarily comfortable with those more elevated occasions where, you know, he's speaking sort of ex cathedra as it were um but, but the, I, I i remember reading that was the other day with quail and i thought that's exactly true it's also true of eisenhower you know mm -hmm. eisenhower was famous for supposedly bumbling around with his senses and then you look at his letters and he, he was a it was again the beautiful plain style this yes. kind of straightforward and direct way. chase he, uh, he had an absolute horror of what he called blowing on, which was, once again, the business of politicians. Once again, he did not want to talk about himself. He did not want to sound like the typical uh, self-glorifying uh, uh, politician. Uh, once again, right. the voice of his mother was ringing in his ears. And yet that's what you've got to do in a position like that. And that created problems for the likes of you. So, I I tried, I believe pretty nearly every speechwriter who worked for him tried to get him to talk about what he went through as a 20-year-old when the, when the aircraft was shot down. 
And, I, and every obituary has, has placed, given a prominent role to that incident, as of course they would, because human beings respond to that. He wouldn't talk about it. And I'm convinced, really, that w people only get to write about it and talk about it after he's gone and not around anymore to tell them, no, 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 don't, don't go on about that. I couldn't get him to do that. I'll give you one more, purely for your amusement. Mm -hmm. I was trying to jazz up, this is in 1982, su summer we've got a lot of stops for congressional candidates. And I'm trying to think, what can I do to bring a little life to this? And I went in and played for him. I think it was just him and me, but you may have been there. I, I got a little cassette tape, and I played Franklin Roosevelt's famous Madison Square Garden speech, oh. in which he attacked three then prominent Republicans. You may ask anyone <laughs> why the country is better today, but don't ask Martin Barton or Fish. <laughs> and he had the crowd chanting this with him, Martin, Barton, and Fish. <laughs> Joe Martin was Speaker of the House, as I recall. All right, All right Hamilton Republican Fisher. Leader. And so I said, Mr. Vice President, and so I, th I th think I found a way for you to do this. And I said, oh, me and FDR. I, and, it w and the refrain was going to be Walter, Teddy, and Tip. Walter Mondale, Teddy Kennedy, and Tip O'Neill. So I wrote it. Off we went to North Carolina, which was the first event. And he delivered it. And the audience started chanting. It worked <laughs> perfectly. He enjoyed it. And we got on Air Force Two to go to the next event in North Carolina. And I heard Jesse Helms go to the forward cabin and say, why, George, <laughs> that's the finest speech I've ever heard you give. <laughs> Next stop, he delivers the whole speech, but omits that. <laughs> and so I went to the forward cabin, and the moment he saw me come in, he, he kind of winced. And I said, Mr. Vice President, he said, yes, yes. Barr thought it was undignified. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so explain that. There's this... <laughs> Explain that one. I can't uh, uh, criticize Mrs. Bush's no, of uh, attitude, but I would say that <clears throat> the idea of a rhetorical trick, uh, a device, That's it. That's would be it. something he would recoil at doing, not just because of his mother's advice or his wife's censorship, but rather the fact that that's what those other guys did, and I'm right. not them. It was a trick, essentially. Yeah, you know, the, the, I was reminded the business about his World War II experience, which I also <coughs> tried to... You tried to get it in, and he wouldn't do it. And he wouldn't do it. And um, right before I was hired and went to work there was the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And he went out to Hawaii um, and did a set of speeches that were written uh, for the occasions. And my colleagues who were there at the time, they told me this right when I started to work, so I would get a sense of what was going on. Um, these speeches would come back with, from the Oval Office with whole sections, paragraphs, mm -hmm. stripped out. And it was all the sentimental things, or what he would, might say was sentimental. And he, he said to one of my colleagues, jokingly, he said, you're not going to make me cry. <laughs> and, but sure enough, and I've noticed this about Jim, Bob Dole is like this. They are very, they don't talk about it. The ones who were there. The ones who were there. And when they do, they can puddle up, and they can, gets very, they're very deeply caught up in what happened, obviously. And um, so Bush joked about that and said, cut out everything that would at all might tug at him a little bit. To, but uh, they did get some of that stuff back in a couple of the speeches, and he sure enough puddled up puddle when up. he did it. And it is true, just to echo what uh, Andy said, that a lot of war veterans of any war are reluctant to talk about their experiences. Yeah. Usually the ones who do the talking in the bars weren't really there. Right. <laughs> right. right. All right. Acts of graciousness. I'll go first. Just to give you... What we've been talking about so far is the public George Bush, but it's the, the stories that have been coming out in this week's uh, uh, celebrating him. The, the accumulation of little in incidents strikes me as kind of important to understanding what he was actually like. Okay, as you may recall, 25 years old, concerned at any moment I might be fired, and trying to figure out what on earth speech writing would lead to, I applied to law school while I was working for him. And to my astonishment, I got in. And then I realized I didn't know whether I should go or not. And my father had never even been to college. He couldn't advise me. There and I was still so new in Washington I couldn't think of anybody sort of older figure who could give me advice except George Bush himself. And so after a speech meeting, I said, by the way, could I ask you something? 
and he became immediately quite a, intent. And I just laid this out for him. We must have talked for 20 minutes or something like that. <laughs> it's ridiculous, <laughs> I'm getting choked up. <laughs> because it's ridiculous, what he said in the end was, well, you know, I think, I think you're doing right now what a lot of people would go to law school to hope to do, so I mean, it's your decision. But, but what was astonishing to me was that he just, whatever was happening next on the schedule, and as you know, Chase, he was scheduled minute by minute, it just stopped mm. because he wanted to, to take that. Uh, wh what happened next in the life of a young person was important to him. Okay, mm. you go. <laughs> well, I, I was mentioning this to somebody the other day. One of the things that, that I rem sticks out in my mind was um, after he lost in 92 um, and got beat bad. We got beat real bad. Um, and whenever I saw him after that, and, or, and this was true of colleagues, uh, in the sort of exit interview, last picture kind of thing before everybody leaves the White House for good, he was apologetic. He was apologizing to us because he felt that somehow he'd let us down. Of course, we all thought he deserved better. You know, <laughs> Why couldn't we have figured out a way to help him more? And it was just, I just here's the President of the United States with you know, 30-year-old people who worked their heart out for him, and he'd worked as hard as possible. And it, he was taking it on himself and wanted them to know that it wasn't your fault. I'm the one who, I'm the one who, who was supposed to win, and I didn't. And I just, it made people sort of even more in awe of him than they already were. Chase, you have five decades. <laughs> Give us one or two. Well, echoing uh, what we just heard about uh, the, the dread results of the 1992 election and what followed, uh, I know in my case, probably in many other cases, uh, he was an active recruiter. He called up people, heads of corporations, uh, recommending staffers to get jobs, uh, which needless to say was not his responsibility, not in the Constitution that I recall, but that was something he would want to do. Uh, he just had a heart for other people. Uh, a desire to help other people, didn't matter who they were, what their age was, what their political affiliation was, whether they supported him or not, uh, that's just the way he was. Okay, now <clears throat> I'm gonna, I want to trot out a little idea. By the way, what I'm about to trot out, I'm borrowing from a friend of mine at Dartmouth, Professor Russell Muirhead, who, <clears throat> the notion is two components of a particular ideal, and component number one would be toughness or effectiveness, getting things done. And Lord, did he, I mean, just click down the resume from pilot to businessman and all the way to president. And the other is graciousness, kindness. And you put those two together and you have a particular ideal, the American gentleman. In Europe, the notion of gentlemanliness would have to do with cultural refinement, knowing which wine to use, speaking with a certain accent and so forth. In this country, the American gentleman is, a, is someone who gets things done in a particular way. Do you buy that? And then the next question is, is, is it a useful ideal? Did we just say farewell to someone today at the National Cathedral? Did we, did we say farewell to a president and to a time in America when that kind of person could exist? Or is there something permanent to aspire to in the example that he said? Chase. <laughs> <laughs> no, no alphabetical. Uh, no. <laughs> um, well, I, I was just thinking today when we were um, at the at the funeral service, and uh, his son George W. spoke extremely movingly of his father, and I, I compare his presidency, W.'s presidency, to um, President Bush's, H. W. Bush's presidency, and I, I kept coming back to the sense of gentlemanliness. It's almost like manliness in a sense. Yes, um, yes. And it's, it, it really works as, as kind of a scaffolding for what you do. And so it's less important what it is that you're doing, it, doing than how you go about doing it. And if you have this scaffolding, this sense of, of gentlemanliness, um, you are much more likely to do the right thing in your life. Even if you you and I, and you may do different things. If, we're, if we still have that code internalized, um, it, it's, a, it's a mode of behavior that points you in the right direction, if that makes 
sense. And, and I, I, I feel that, I felt that very strongly with him, and I saw it in his uh, son on occasion. And they were very different kind of presidents, but they were um, beloved by the people who worked for them because they had that, that sense of being a gentleman. You just behaved in a certain way. Chase? Um, can't say it any better than that. I, I really believe uh, uh, Andy has captured the heart of it. All right. Washington then and now. You've been in this town since the Reagan years. And um, George Bush, gentleman president. Some contrast, perhaps, in the current town, sense of polarization and so forth. Is that ideal? Is, is gentlemanliness still worth aspiring to in politics today, or is it just a or is it just a polite way to let yourself get beat? No. Well, I think a lot of people feel that way, that, that you know, nice guys finish last yeah. and, and that sort of thing. Um, but that's also a generational thing uh, in that it, it's not so much the ideologies have shifted or, or that it, it's this mode of behavior, this ideal of behavior um, is really, I mean, we see it, we see it mocked openly um, in the White House today. Yeah. Legacy here. Uh, and the first question here is the Reagan question. The Wall Street Journal's editorial and appreciation of, of George Bush, but it placed him again and again, it placed him in context with Ronald Reagan. Bush took office when the results of Ronald Reagan's two terms were playing out to America's benefit around the world. Reagan's boldness and ideological conviction won the Cold War, but Bush's cautious temperament and long experience help to negotiate a transition. Well, boldness and conviction versus cautiousness and long experience. At, are these two, Ronald Reagan and George Bush, going to be forever on an, uh, a reputational teeter-totter when one is up, the other is down? How, how, what's the correct way to understand, to understand George Bush, to understand the Bush administration following eight years of Reagan? Because there was eight years of antecedent administration which set the tone, set the agenda, set the objective, which yes. was the defeat of communism. Uh, George Bush had no problem whatsoever with inheriting that. That's, I think, at the heart of the criticism that he received when he was asked his vision. And he dismissed that uh, as a, a need. And that's quite true because the vision had been seen by Ronald Reagan or any other historical predecessor that Reagan might pick and choose, but that was the context of the time, and the key thing was to keep it going. Now, he felt that a uh, Bush administration would not be Ronald Reagan's third term, it right. would be his administration, and that was reflected in many of the things we've been discussing, plus certain personnel changes and certain uh, ways of doing things, but at no point was it ever a rejection of Reaganism. Andy? Yeah, I think that's a very good good way to put it, that um, this, it, it, it diminishes his accomplishment to say that it was sort of um, mopping up. Yes, um, right. But there is a sense in which a lot of the things that he did rounded out the things that had begun earlier in the 80s. And, but it's, <laughs> it, it's not meant to be diminishing because what, what the, huge the kind, these were huge challenges that the country faced, uh, you know, everybody knows them now, the fall of the wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, domestically the tremendous, SNL the SNL crisis, which was, could have ended up crippling the country at a time when it really needed to be strong as the, our enemy was collapsing. Um, that's, that isn't mopping up, and that, in a sense, it's not even fair to call it rounding out. It's particular achievements that required incredible subtlety and skill and encourage, really, to just, you know, face them and then execute. All right. Again, from that same Wall Street Journal editorial, this is a question of temperament, the temperament and the times, a little bit of what I was trying to get at before. Bush had grown up in an era when compromise was more common. Bush failed to see the change in America toward deeper partisan divisions. George H.W. Bush was, by temperament, a man of the middle in an age of increasing polarization. So there's almost a suggestion that by the time he didn't just lose to Bill Clinton, he'd already become a man of the past in some ways. Is that fair? 
I don't think so, because uh, I mean we've talked about this before ourselves. That the it, it's almost as though this incredibly ideologized era that the world we, we now live in now, right. now kind of crept up on him unawares. Um, but the fact is that Bill Clinton himself wasn't a particularly ideological figure either, and he didn't govern as one, especially after the first two years. So it's not really, I don't think it's fair to say that the, that the changeover um, that somehow hurt his historical legacy or anything of that sort. Chase? Um, the governing uh, view of George Bush was doing the job. Uh, was governing. That's his, that was his specialty, uh, to be the uh, tactician, the, or technician even, in making certain things happen. And how he made them happen, such as the reunification of Germany or managing the breakup of the Soviet Union, was an outgrowth of his long experience. This was the value he brought to Ronald Reagan uh, and which he recognized in others, such as uh, a Jim Baker or a Dick Cheney, uh, to be able to make things happen for which the agenda had already been set. Uh, and we don't know because he was very quiet and modest about what advice he gave Ronald Reagan, but it's very possible that a lot of what happened in the Reagan years was the result of that quiet advice. I can't say mm -hmm. that's true, but I, we know he was there and we know Reagan depended upon him uh, to do certain diplomatic missions and to uh, be the voice of the administration. So there are moments in American history where you almost think th something has happened that's providential. There are also moments in American history where you'd like to say to God, what are you thinking here? But what, you know, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson both die on July 4th, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. It is something of a miracle that the man who was in office as the Soviet Union broke up, the Warsaw Pact collapsed, the reunification of Germany had to be accomplished, and a new example had to be set, the new, uh, that the international order would still be a, an order of na nations and boundaries, and that is to say, Saddam Hussein had to be kicked out of Kuwait, that the man who was at the helm was someone who was already personally known to all the leaders who were dealing with these crises and was known to be cautious, honest, prudent. Prudent. <laughs> is, that, is that a fair reading of it? Uh, what, that it's providential? Yes. <laughs> that God made George H.W. Bush president? <laughs> Something and, like that. I think it was Jerry Falwell <laughs> who made it. Uh, no, well. No. I mean, uh, I've always thought that the people who say that uh, when they survive something, like being shot down, that God has spared me for a purpose, should at that moment be hit by the lightning <laughs> bolt for presumptuousness of imagining what God has in mind. Uh, however, it's, however, it's su sufficient to say that, thank goodness, God did spare George H.W. Bush on that afternoon in 1944 uh, to proceed along paths that we are... Uh, not uh, competent to comment on. All right. But I would like to say, sure, if we yes, have a course. moment or two, that the uh, expertise of George Bush in foreign affairs was the result, you might say, of a political happenstance. This was uh, uh, something that happened many times in his life in which he managed to convert a reversal into an advance. He ran for the Senate in 1970 uh, to uh, be uh, the first uh, or to finish out the a larger Republican vision uh, to go to the place where his father had served, and he lost to Lloyd Benson, again back in the day when conservative Democrats d dominated Texas. Having been on the House Ways and Means Committee, what George Bush really wanted to do was to go to the Treasury Department. House Ways and Means when he was in Congress. He served yes. two terms in the House. Yes. Sorry, and he ahead. was a freshman uh, member, which was quite rare, quite unusual. But he wanted to be uh, given an appointment by Richard Nixon to the Treasury. Well, that didn't happen. It went to, of all people, John Connolly, uh, then still a conservative Democrat who had done more than anybody to engineer the election of Lloyd Benson and therefore the defeat of George Bush. Right. So that was something of a blow. And what did the Nixon White House do? Well, they gave him a kind of a, a throwaway job to be the ambassador to the United Nations, 
which those of us who were Texas Republican supporters thought this is the end of his career if he's going to go to the UN, for which there was little love in Texas. But he took the position and went off to make for himself a lifelong expertise and career specialty of foreign affairs. And many of the world leaders you were referring to were those he met when he and they were the permanent representatives of their countries to the United Nations. Many of them became foreign ministers and uh, prime ministers and presidents of their countries by the time George Bush himself stepped onto the world stage. Uh, that was uh, just one of many things he did throughout a career to take advantage of uh, a bad circumstance and to make it uh, r r fruitful for him personally, but also to do some good while he was there. Last question. <clears throat> this is George H.W. Bush in an interview he gave a couple years ago to John Meacham, who was then working on a biography. This is, this is Bush in his own words. I am lost between the glory of Reagan, monuments everywhere, trumpets, the great hero, and the trials and tribulations of my own sons." Close quote. Now, I think you'd both feel the impulse if you had been there to say, no, Mr. President, that's not right at all. What would you say? What is the, what I, is I'm puzzled by his word of, the use of the word lost, because he was very much there, and we could make the case that George W. Bush became president because his father had been president, which is another way of saying George W. Bush became president because he was governor of Texas. And that uh, clearly grew out of the regard uh, people had for the Bush family. Right. So uh, once again, I think President Bush was being a little excessively modest when he used that phrase. Your daughter is in her 20s. What's, what, give me two sentences. What, would she, what does she need to grasp to hold on to about the man with whom you worked for so long. Just summing up uh, what you have led us in this discussion to say, namely uh, gentlemanliness, uh, an appreciation for expertise and experience, uh, a consideration for others, uh, having a base on which to build, uh, be it ideological or, or personal experience. Uh, that is the kind of person who uh, not only he was, but I think to speak to our present times, the kind of person that the American public will always come back to wanting. It isn't just that they want somebody who th flings red meat at them uh, in rallies or, or other public utterances. They do want somebody who will do the job and do it well. Andy? Well, you know, it's, it, it's the word that's always associated with them, thanks to Dana Carvey, I guess, is prudence. And, you know, prudence is, is the ancients said is the queen of virtues. It, it's, it's the kind of, without the virtue of prudence, a sense of possibilities, a reading of the situation you're in, um, what is too far, what's not far enough. If you don't have that sense of prudence, either as a politician or a business person or any other walks of life, um, it's very hard to get something done, accomplished, and to create something. And he was, he, um, it's too bad it became a joke line because he was the exemplar of, of prudence. Of a serious virtue. Yeah. Journalist and author Andrew Ferguson, ambassador, businessman, and author Chase Untermeyer, thank you. Thank you, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution, shooting today in the Hoover Institution's Washington offices. Thank you. I will keep America moving forward, always forward for a better America, for an endless, enduring dream and a thousand points of light. This is my mission and I will complete it.